our Father, uh, whom we are privileged to come before in prayer in Jesus' name. We bow before you and before your word. Teach us, we pray. Uh, open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and change us uh, by what we read, by what we hear, by what we see. We are yours, we are bought with a price. Lord, work in us your holy will. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we take a look at the remainder of 1 Peter chapter 2, a very interesting topic. I don't think uh, Americans are real thrilled about this submission. There are all, all kinds of uh, uh, groups, if you will, uh, who love their independence, uh, love their position in the culture or whatever it happens to be. But this portion of uh, Peter's first letter does speak to submission to authority, and not just for any reason, submission to authority for the Lord's sake. <clears throat> Last week, we read about the events that led up to Moses striking the rock at Horeb. It prefigured the punishment that Jesus the Messiah would receive in our place. The sin that brought about the striking of the rock was the people's questioning of Moses. In this case, because they were in a place that had no water. Note that Moses was called by God and very obviously prepared for his task of, of um, speaking to Pharaoh uh, because he was raised in the household of Pharaoh. He was given by God, signs to perform before Pharaoh, commandments to speak. And so he was indeed God's prophet to the people. So by questioning Moses, they were questioning, doubting, and offending God. Well, you may think <clears throat> we're supposed to be studying Peter's first letter. What are we doing in the Old Testament? Well, there are a lot of relevant examples in the Old Testament of what the Spirit of God tells us in Peter's letter. I think this will help our minds grasp the scope of God's teaching through Peter if we look at other examples in Scripture. One of those that I really want to read to you this morning is that of Korah's Rebellion. Korah's rebellion is found in Numbers chapter 16. <clears throat> now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of God? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show you who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now 
you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that God, the God of Israel, has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation and to minister to them? And that he has brought you near him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and they said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, that you must also make yourself a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, not given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, and I have not harmed one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Be present to you and all your company before the Lord, you and they, and Aaron tomorrow. And let every one of you take his censer and put incense on it, and every one of you bring before the Lord his censer, 250 censers, you also, and, um, and Aaron, each his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on them and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and shall you be angry with all the congregation? And the Lord said to Moses, saying, Say to the congregation, Get away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with their sins. So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents, together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die as all men die, or if they are visited with the, by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down into Sheol, then you shall know. <clears throat> they go down alive into Sheol. Then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to take up the censers out of the blaze and scatter the fire far and wide, for they have become holy. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be made into hammer plates as a covering for the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, and they became holy. Thus they shall be a sign to all the people of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned had offered, 
and they were hammered out as a covering for the altar to be re a reminder to the people of Israel so that no outsider who is not of the descendants of Aaron should draw near to burn incense before the Lord, lest he become like Korah and his company, as the Lord said to him through Moses. But on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And when the congregation had assembled against Moses and against Aaron, they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, a cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces, and Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer, and put fire on it from, from off the altar, and lay incense on it, and carry it quickly to the congregation, and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly, and behold, the plague had already begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped. That was a long reading. Yes, it was. <clears throat> But the people grumbled against God's representative. <clears throat> well, there's another example. I'm not going to read it to you. But I'm sure you all remember Absalom, uh, one of David's sons. Absalom wanted to be the king. He didn't want to wait. Remember, David was anointed by God's prophet, Samuel, to be king. Absalom was never anointed by a prophet of God. Absalom just wanted something. So he, in, in rebellion against his father, who was God's anointed king, he um, came up with a plan to overtake, to take the throne away from his father, and actually did for a time. And if you've, if you've read the uh, account fairly recently, you'll remember some of the awful things that he did to basically uh, shame his father and uh, show that he was actually in control. Uh, that did not turn out well for Absalom. It turned out very much the same as the way it turned out for Korah and those with him. Okay. Well, last week I mentioned that the Apostle Paul wrote more than three chapters of God's instructions on how we're to uh, act as disciples of Christ. And in the midst of those instructions lie seven verses that address the very same topic that we're dealing with in 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, stay with me. And we will read these uh, words together. Do remember that Paul was writing to the believers in Rome. Peter was writing to the exiles, the elect exiles, in the dispersion. However, these words were meant for different people at that time, but these words have come down to us, and we know that they are meant for us as well as those who were living in that day. Romans chapter 13, the first seven verses. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. 
For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. If I may stop briefly in the midst of that, does the account of Korah's Korah's rebellion rebellion ring a bell here? For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Um, A brief comment about governing authorities. These authorities, which are uh, referred to here, institutions, um, governing authorities, individuals even, are appointed by God. His standard in ruling over others is justice and righteousness. We read that the authorities are responsible to punish bad conduct, not good. Who sets the standard for what is good and what is bad? I bet all of you know the answer to that question. Okay. Well, rulers and governing authorities are given the task of bearing the sword, that is, punishing wrongdoers. If they're given these responsibilities and fail to keep them, according to God's standard, they will incur judgment. So we're given, as God's people, the responsibility to be subject to these authorities or else we will incur judgment if we do not. And they must rule according to God's standard or they incur judgment. God is sovereign over all his creation And God is just. And God has set overseers over various realms. In this case, we're talking about the civil realm. If you get the idea that God has established order in his creation to care for the needs of his creatures, from the king, the president, emperor, to babies in the womb, I think you're on to something. As human beings, offspring of Adam, we all know that uh, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory and his goodness. So if we see a ruler punishing good behavior and rewarding bad behavior, whose standard is he or she looking to? I think we all know the answer to that question. So we should take comfort in knowing that God is just. As we turn now to 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll soon see some of these teachings and some additional detailed information for us, instruction, not just information, instruction. All, I believe, related to God's order and the responsibility of everyone to honor him as the righteous and sovereign ruler of creation. The first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 2 say, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme 
or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Well, well this instruction from the Lord to Peter, directed at the elect exiles, <clears throat> is written at a time when Nero was emperor, as likely also Romans was written by Paul under the same emperor. Um, Peter's admonition or his instruction to honor everyone is similar to Paul's um, words, honor to whom honor is owed. And in another place, Paul wrote, consider others better than yourself. We're to honor others. <clears throat> and um, he gives examples of who they're to be subject to in this passage. And in later passages that... Um, um, our teachers on the remainder of uh, Peter's first letter will we'll get into those other instructions. Um, but in this passage, he mentions that we're to be subject to emperor and governors, governing authorities. Um, he also wrote that we're to do this for the Lord's sake. What does that mean, for the Lord's sake? Where does the ultimate authority lie? Very clearly from what we've read thus far this morning, very clearly, the ultimate authority is God, the sovereign, the creator, the almighty. <clears throat> and the Father has invested in Christ Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth. Dr. Sproul writes um, of Nero, the emperor, when the letter was written, when Peter's letter was written, and he says this, he was under Christ's authority, but would not submit to it. He wouldn't submit because he had a spirit of lawlessness, the spirit which today works in the sons of disobedience. Satan is identified with lawlessness. The whole of the human race fell disastrously when Adam and Eve refused to submit to the Creator, following Satan's lies instead. Therefore, each time we do not submit to the rules that plague us all, we are casting our vote with lawlessness. And each time we go out of our way to submit, we bear witness to the one whose law stands above every law. Every time we obey our employer, our teacher, our parents, we give honor to Christ who reigns over the whole universe. There it is. We submit for the Lord's sake. We honor Christ with our obedience to his teaching through his apostles, to his commandments, okay? We're to submit to the authorities over us so that Christ's righteous rule over creation will be obeyed. <clears throat> we have examples in scripture of what God expects of those he calls to leadership, both in church, in the church, and in, in state matters. Uh, those who do not rule according to God's standard are subject to God's punishment. We've read that. Um, those who rule in dependence on God have been shown mercy and favor by God. And we, This is another thing we could read throughout the Old Testament, how God has blessed those who rule according to to his will, uh, who do not um, um, rebel against those in authority over them. So Peter isn't 
telling us here that all earthly rulers are going to be good ones. Nonetheless, they have been ordained to function in those positions. It's our duty to follow God's teaching on how we relate to them, and we've looked at a couple examples today that show us how rebels against authority are dealt with. Dr. Sproul and many other Christian teachers agree that the direction we receive here is qualified, has limits. When Nebuchadnezzar ordered all in his realm to bow down and worship the golden image that he had made, um, there were some who declined. And if you remember that, Nebuchadnezzar was irate, wasn't even close to what he was furious. And he um, gave these three men, you remember them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave these three men another opportunity to fall down and worship this golden image that he had put up. But they refused the king's order to worship For the same reason that Jesus refused Satan's offer in the wilderness when Satan said, worship me, saying that he would give him all the kingdoms of the earth. And what was Jesus' answer? You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew of that commandment to worship the God alone. As, as Jesus repeated before Satan. The point here is that authorities which demand something that is in violation of God's commandment for us, we are to decline, we are to resist, we are not to follow those things. Um, we are to submit to the authorities unless the ordinances prohibit us from doing what God commands. Let me give one example that I can think of, which has recent uh, application to us um, in Hebrews, we read, do not uh, neglect or forsake the gathering together as some are wont to do. Is that, is that, do I have the right uh, book? Okay. Um, in the beginning of our time away, there was a lot of um, unknown about this uh, disease. And in the interest of your safety, um, we gathered together and made a decision. And at the soonest, at the earliest opportunity, we returned to gathering together. Um, so that's an example of, of how things can be mandated. Um, so if the ordinances prohibit us from doing what God tells us to do, Dr. Sproul says we not only uh, should we not be submissive, but we must not submit. So there is a, a qualification there, and we see it, we do see it in Scripture. Um, another example, um, Peter in Acts, oh goodness, I believe it's chapter 4, Peter and others were um, teaching at uh, Solomon's portico, and as they went to the temple, they came across a man who had been lame from birth. And if you remember, he was asking for alms, and Peter said, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I'll give you. And he healed the man of his lameness in the name of Jesus Christ. He was arrested along with those who were with him 
am taken before the very same authorities who conspired to have the Romans murder Christ. The same ones. Remember this, that in the courtyard of the high priest, this very same Peter denied Christ three times. And yet, when he went before the authorities, who asked him, by what authority or in whose name have you done this? And he told them, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you, the builders, had murdered. And they said, they went and met kind of uh, off to the side and said, you know, we can't do anything to these people because the, um, the people of the city will rise up against us. So they went back and they said, Peter, you're not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus Christ again. Silence. Peter said, whether it is right to obey God or to obey you, you decide. But as for us, we, we can only do what we've been told. And I don't, I, that's not an exact quote, but we will continue to preach in Christ's name. So there you have that other, um, I think, very clear example that when we are commanded by those in authority to do things that Christ has told us uh, that we shouldn't do, we've been commissioned to uh, carry the message of reconciliation to others. And, and if we are told not to do that, that's in direct violation of God's authority. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the remaining, uh, or the, ne the next few verses of this chapter go, go like this. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious, gracious thing. When mindful of God, hang on to that because remember the very first slide talked about sub submission for the Lord's sake. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Wow. Here's a section of God's word that is hard, really hard, though I don't think we should be surprised by it. This is our calling. Yes. Dr. Sproul asks, why does God give his smile of approval on those who suffer patiently when they're victims of unjust treatment? Peter gives us the answer. For to this you have been called. It is our vocation. Calling, vocation, uh, Vocation, the, the, the root word of that, uh, means calling. So when God calls us to a task, it's our duty to obey it. It is commendable when we suffer unjustly and bear the pain in patience because or for the reason that God has called us to that. When we endure in obedience to the Lord, for his sake. Okay, 
we comprehend that we're trusting him in whatever situation this is. <clears throat> now, Dr. Sproul refers to uh, a book that he wrote uh, called uh, Surprised by Suffering. I think we have that in our little bookcase. And it, it came from some uh, lectures that he gave or presentations that he gave in Houston at a, a cancer center there. Anyway, um, obviously it was uh, on the subject of suffering. Uh, but he says that suffering becomes bearable when we understand that we're in that state by the providence of God. And therefore, at that time, it is our vocation. If we fall ill with a terminal disease, we can curse the fates that have brought it to us, or we can see that it is the providence of God. There's nothing worse than to suffer pain or grief for no reason, which is why those without Christ are without hope. For them, ultimately, life is futile. But if their souls become captured by the truth of the gospel, they will know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So there is a purpose even in suffering. That, he says, is probably the hardest biblical truth to embrace. If you stop and think about hardships that were shown in Scripture, I, just, I absolutely love to think of things like Joseph, whose brothers hated him and were going to kill him, and they sold him to some, um, well, I can't remember if they were Edomites or, anyway, um, sold him to some uh, traveling um, sellers and these fellows took him to Egypt and you know how he went uh, into the house he was purchased by um, the master of the of the prison and then was uh, employed as master over that fellow's house and how he wound up in prison for a long time the Lord gave him the understanding of uh, some visions that fellow prisoners had and he was elevated after a number of years to Pharaoh's house. And from that, from that he became, uh, as, as, he, as the Lord gave him um, the understanding of Pharaoh's uh, dream, he became basically the prime minister of Egypt and had authority over everything except the Pharaoh. And he was given the authority to tax the Egyptians, tax their crops, their um, the increase of their herds, whatever, build storehouses for grain. <clears throat> and when the um, uh, time of, of hunger came, I think it was after seven years, if I remember right, seven years, his brothers were sent by his father to Egypt because he heard there was grain in Egypt. And from this, I'll kind of cut to the chase, his whole family was brought to Egypt so that they wouldn't starve during this, um, this time. And they were held in captivity 430 years. And when you stop and think about that, think, why would God do that? But he grew the people, that family of Jacob, sons, daughters, into a people of well over a million, numbers have it perhaps over two million people in that period of time. Okay, it was, it was a place of nurturing. It was a place of hardship. It was a place of trial, but it was a place of nurturing. And you can see it. The prison was a place of nurturing. The, the captivity was a place of nurturing. And when God led the people into the wilderness, they were to be nurtured there to know that God was their God and that he cared for them. 
water from the rock, manna from heaven, meat when they cried for it, on and on. Even in trials, even in difficulties, God provides. Was there ever a greater tragedy, cruelty, and injustice than our Lord Jesus endured? No. But he trusted that God's great purpose would be accomplished in his perfect obedience and in his sacrifice according to the Father's will. Peter writes, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. A very quick aside. This, uh, this is a rather idealized image that you see by a 17th century painter. Um, and let's see if I, yeah, it is rather idealized. Um, but I don't think that Peter means that we must also be crucified. Okay? But that obedience to God's calling, that is, our vocation, is what we're to live out. And if you go, go back, back to Paul's letter, uh, in chapter 12, his first verse says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. If we're, if we're called to die, that's, that's a way of sacrifice. It's a way that God may lead us, but if we are called in other ways to sacrifice to God, then that is what we are to do. But Paul does say, present your bodies as a living sacrifice sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship that is all in trusting God in every situation obeying him which is commendable enduring cruelty and harshness from fear or cowardice is not commendable that kind of submission doesn't get you a commendation from God his commendation comes when we do it for conscience sake. If we submit because we're trying to honor the lordship of God, then such submission, even in times of harshness and cruelty, is commendable. I, I don't know where the rest of you uh, plant yourselves in, in our current uh, culture, but I see tremendous... Uh, application to today, this, this day, May the 22nd of 2022. When we uh, read our scripture reading each day, we marvel at how relevant it is to each day. It's like we could turn on the news and we could hear the same kinds of things that we're reading in God's word. We know from Scripture that God is sovereign. He knows each of his creatures well. He knows the situations they're in. Maybe, maybe you're not seeing it in these words, but the God who knows the number of your days before there's one of them, he knows the number of hairs on your head, he knows a word before it leaves your mouth, he knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. God knows your situation. And he puts people in places where they can be his witness. Whether it's um, like the saints that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, who suffered uh, trials, persecution, mocking, flogging, chains, imprisonment, and worse. None of these were beyond God's sovereign rule. Obviously, God's way is not the world's way. There's night and day difference between them. There is still enmity between the world, that is, Satan's servants, and the children of God, 
I think we'll hear about that a little bit later. Um, as we mentioned already, Christ is over all, and earthly authorities are to rule according to his will. Whether they do or not, we are to live according to the will of God in response to his great work of salvation. If it sounds foreign to us, I can think of a couple of reasons, and I stand here quite um, open before you. First reason I can think of, I've been influenced by the world to the point that my safety, my dignity, my sense of fairness is offended by allowing myself to be abused in the ways that Peter um, mentions in this. The second thing that crosses my mind is that I'm not always taking God at his word. And I don't like to think of this, but that is trusting him or I'm not loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Though my faith is in Christ alone and not in my own righteousness, I struggle to be the disciple that I should be. I would say this is the flesh warring against the spirit, as Paul discusses in the eighth chapter of Romans. It is a battle. It's not always a up-in-your-face battle, but it's a battle nonetheless. Hebrews 11 says, These saints all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They were seeking a homeland, a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Paul wrote in Ephesians about our citizenship in heaven. What a glorious future. Oh, goodness. Okay. The last couple verses from this uh, second chapter. He himself bore our sins. sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. From early in Scripture we read about, about shepherds, shepherds tending flocks of sheep from which individuals are prone to wander, uh, away from the, the group and into danger. Shepherds guard the flock, watchful, ready to defend the sheep as David did against even bears and lions. But David wrote of the Lord as his shepherd, guiding, providing, comforting, carrying him through danger and vindicating him in the presence of his enemies. And in the last state, he would be in the presence of the Lord forever. Those images are precious to believers, and here Peter refers to Christ, our sin bearer, an example, as that good shepherd and God himself, the overseer of our souls. God's call for his people is that they live according to his design, his order, abandoning sin, that is, rebellion against God in all its forms, and living in righteousness. For this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Amen. <clears throat> Let me close for us. I'm sorry to go over. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word from, from Genesis 1 to Revelation, I think it's 22. Thanks from beginning to end for your holy word. For it teaches us, it guides us, it corrects us, it disciplines us, it, it actually shows us our need. It leads us to Christ, um, the great Redeemer uh, that you have purposed to um, offer himself up, to be offered as a living sacrifice or as a sacrifice 
so that we may live in that righteousness, in his righteousness, and be reconciled to you. We thank you for your great plan, for the, the great working out of it, and for the great Savior that you have granted us. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
Good morning. Once again, good morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Lakemont Presbyterian Church. Uh, welcome to this service of worship where we seek to give praise, honor, and glory to our Lord and Savior and our King, Lord Jesus. And in the name of our King, we want to welcome our guests this morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us, please know that you are our guests. We are glad that you're here. Uh, we hope that your time with us will be an encouragement, uh, will be a blessing, and we hope that you will give us an opportunity after the service to get to know you better. Uh, if you have not picked up a copy of our bulletin or you still need one, uh, please raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring one to you. They can also help you find a seat if you're still looking. Uh, but we do have a few announcements, which you'll find inside your bulletin. Let me invite you to turn to that right now. Uh, tonight, weather permitting, we are having an outdoor fellowship from 5 to 7.30 at Brookfield Park. Uh, Pastor Brian has told me there will be a cornhole tournament and we are all coming after the Lamberts, the defending champs from our last one. So we're ready for you, Casey. Um, if weather becomes a problem, we will uh, let people know through our calling post, our Facebook page, and possibly the website. So please stay tuned, but we're hopeful that that can still occur. Another thing we're hopeful that it will occur is officer nominations. Uh, we are receiving them through the end of the month, so for practical purposes, next Sunday, uh, we've received, I believe, four or five nominees for deacon. That's great. We haven't received any nomination for elders, so if you can prayerfully think of men uh, to nominate for the eldership here, uh, please fill out the form and make sure they agree with you, and there's a place on the form where they have to agree to be nominated, so please uh, get those in if you uh, have nominees, and please do that by next Sunday. Also, a reminder, our Summer Scripture Memory Challenge is beginning. You should already have the verses, and they're available on our website as well, I believe. But starting next Sunday, May 29th, there will be listeners available, kids, for you to recite the verses you've memorized and start earning the points etc. And they will be available. Uh, Glenda, where are they going to be available? In the children's building. I wanted to make sure, but I couldn't find it on the announcement. Trying to do two things at once. Uh, ladies, the Women's Summer Bible Study is beginning very soon, but today is the last day to order your books. So there is an envelope out there. If you just want to write a check, you can also uh, do that at our website. So if you'd like to take part in this great study, Breathe, looking at the Lord's Prayer, uh, you better hurry. There's also a list on the inside of your announcements of 
all the different meeting places for the different ladies groups that will be studying uh, that curriculum. So uh, lots of options for you, day, night, afternoon, different locations. So please consider being a part of that. Uh, there will be a baby shower for Missy Connor. And as we said last week, the date changed. It is now correct in your bulletin. That'll be at the Wexford Clubhouse July 9th. More details to follow. And then uh, our big sister church, First Prez, is inviting our women to join them for the Gospel Coalition's Women's Conference June 16th to 18th. Uh, I believe they're watching the simulcast at First Prez. Uh, so there's information in the bulletin on how you can register if you'd like to be a part of that with our sisters over at First Press. Uh, Brian, did I miss anything? Congregation, did I miss any announcements we need to make this morning? Last chance. Okay, hearing none, uh, there is a meditation in your bulletin and Lord willing on the screen in a few moments, let's prepare our hearts to come into God's presence and give him glory. And then Pastor Brian will bring the Lord's call for us to worship him from his word. Good morning. <clears throat> Our men's Bible study on Wednesday, Wednesday morning. mornings is studying the Song of Solomon, and it's been a fun and sometimes awkward time of studying God's Word. But I was struck this week that in the, in the beginning, the woman says, basically, I'm ugly. The sun has ruined my skin. And then you come to chapter 4, and Solomon says, you're beautiful. And he says, you were altogether perfect. And so as we come into worship this morning, let us not look at ourselves, but let us consider how God sees us. He calls us all together perfect, lovely, and beautiful. We come to worship knowing God calls us beautiful. Let us now stand and worship the God who calls us beautiful. 
Our call to worship comes from 1 Chronicles 16, 11 through 13. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Let us now together do the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, you are near to all who call on you, to all who call on you in truth. Your people have gathered to call on your name and commune with you. As you have promised, be near to us and accept our worship. Through the work of the resurrected Christ, may our praise and offerings be given in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name, amen. may be seated. Well, normally I get to send our graduating seniors off, but I know that I am just one of many who get to come alongside parents in the raising and nurturing of the children of our church. And for Miss Anna Peters, I know that Elder Jim Denmark has had a great influence in the Peters' lives. So I invite actually Elder Jim Denmark up to come and say, uh, embarrass her appropriately (laughs) in an encouraging way as she graduates. Come on up as well, Anna. Well, it is a privilege. It truly is. First of all, it's a privilege to, to, to come up here and to say yes, uh, it, to, to speak of Anna Peters. Uh, I have known the Peters. They are dear friends. Uh, they are near neighbors. And um, we have watched uh, Anna... Uh, over the years, and um, the first time you saw her is when Matthew and Jolene years ago brought her forward as a, an infant, and we baptized, and remember, we made a covenant then to help raise her in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You were, say we were going to instruct her, and you have, and uh, then another time is when Anna said, I want to come out on my own and say that Jesus is my Lord, and she joined the church, and again, we came alongside her. And so a third time, brothers and sisters of Lakemont, we are going to come alongside her as we send her out. 
And so she is now graduated from homeschooling and is going out. And I would just give her a second to a, few, a moment just to say what she's going to be doing and where she's going to be doing it. So, Anna. Um, hi, I'm short. Um, <laughs> I plan to go to a place called the Academy of Arts in Greenville. It's a small Christian conservatory um, for the dramatic arts and um, film arts. And I plan to be doing a gap year there, which is going to be a full calendar year, basically to learn how to make movies. So that's about it. Well, I mean, that's exciting. I don't know how many graduates we've had come up here and never said that, right? So that is exciting. That's well, we true, too. <laughs> That, that's what you do when you're shepherding an elders, Jim Denmark, though. You know, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so just one quick word from the scriptures, and then we have a gift for you. Blessed is Anna Peters, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way. Wait a minute. It is, say, Anna Peters here. Psalm 1. Wow. Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But her delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law she meditates day and night. She'll be like a tree planted by streams of water that yields her fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and its, uh, and its um, oh gosh, leaf does, it, it's, it yields its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither, and in all she does, she prospers. That is true of you, Okay. And as we send you out, I just point you to God's word that ask you to meditate on his law, meditate on his word day and night, because that Psalm 1 is for you. It's for every believer. And it will, because at the end of that Psalm, it says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. He knows your way. He knows you, and he will lead you in that. And the Psalms are replete with times when it's going to be hard in times when it's going to be rejoicing. And in all those times, not only in the Psalms, but the Psalms are a great place to find it, but in the entire counsel of God's word, you can find what you need there. You know, you'll have this family of believers praying for you. Your family uh, at home will be praying for you. And we just look forward to seeing what God will do in the coming years of your life. So let me pray for you. Father, I do thank you for the gift of just this moment to acknowledge all that she has done, the hard work she has put in in, in uh, homeschooling. And now as you send her out into uh, this new adventure in Greenville, we know that you will be with her, you will watch over her, she, you will keep her in your care. And so we just thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here at Lakemont, for the covenant that they made to come alongside her and come alongside the Peters family how faithful and true you have been, how the preaching of the word has gone into her ears from this pulpit, how people in the nursery have cared for her and Sunday school classes have cared for her and raised her in the faith. Oh, that we would be as faithful as you are to her. and We can rest in that. You are a faithful God and true. We thank you because you showed your faithfulness in Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Congratulations, Anna and the Peters family. If you now would, please stand for our confession of faith. Please stand for our confession of faith. We will confess that sin is real, and so are its consequences. Let us declare together what we believe the scriptures teach. What are the punishments of sin in this world? The punishments of sin in this world are either inward as blindness of mind a reprobate sense, strong delusions, hardness of heart, horror of conscience, and vile affections, or outward as the curse of God on the creatures for our sake and all other evils that befall us in our bodies, names, estates, relations, and employments together with death itself. What are the punishments of sin in the world to come? All punishments of sin in the world to come are everlasting separation from the comforting presence of God and most grievous torments in soul and body without relief 
in hellfire forever. You may be seated. As we've read, the punishments for sin, that implores us all the more to turn from it. And therefore, we will now confess our sins and seek God's forgiveness. So let us now confess our sins before our gracious and merciful God. O Lord God, your eyes are all our ways. We are not hidden from your face, nor is our iniquity hidden from your eyes. Truly, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Hear our confession, merciful Father, and forgive us for Christ's sake. Please keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Please take a moment now to silently confess your personal sin. Lord, as we have acknowledged our sin, we would humanly expect you to raise your hand to punish us. But instead, you raise your hand to bless us, forgive us, and hug us. Thank you for your abounding and everlasting grace for those who are in Christ. Thank you for this promise of pardoning grace from Psalm 103, 8 through 10. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Amen.
There he is. I was looking for you in the back. Let's pray. Lord, in your scripture, you tell us to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and that you are near to us when we call on you, when we call on you in truth. I thank you for the privilege we have to call upon you and that we truly are joyful, faithful, and patient when we cry out to you. Father, I praise you for your incredible greatness. As we drive down the road, we see the marvelous creation that you have given to us to enjoy. And we praise you for that. Father, may we never, ever be mindful that what we enjoy is from you. You are God. You are sovereign. You are the creator. And we praise you for that. Father, but at the same time, as David said many times, we're a church of sinners. We're fallen people. We're people that fall short of a perfect mark. Father, I thank you that you care enough to forgive us. That in your son you've created that redeeming act of love. And most importantly, grace and mercy in our lives. Father, I pray for the many things within our church family. I thank you for our staff as I read the meditation that not all preachers are honest, not all sermons are true, and you even warned us about wolves. I thank you that we worship in a church where our staff is true to your word. Thank you for Dave, for Brian, thank you for Beth, for Bob and Joan as they minister to us. I thank you that you have blessed us with the staff that we can uh, clearly follow, knowing that, that you are the center most of their lives. Father, I pray for, for our teachers in this body that we have. I thank you for their faithfulness, particularly as we heard testimony from Anna today that um, from what Jim has said that she has been influenced by the smallest of ages from the teachers that give her their time in nursery and, and early adolescence all the way through teen years. And we thank you, Father, you've, you've given us teachers that are committed to you. Father, I thank you for the women in our church and for what they do, their desire to, to care for our flock in, in special ways, whether it's in food or whether it's in Bible studies. I thank you, Father, for them. Father, I thank you for our building committee as we are close to what seemed to be an endless journey, but a journey that you clearly have been in front of. And I thank you for each one here. I thank you for, for John and his leadership of that committee. And at times where we were able to endure stress, but Father, we see the finished product before us, and we look forward to excitingly what you're going to provide. And I pray even now, Father, for people when we move into the building that will be coming as visitors, that we would know how to love them and to care for them, and at some point, disciple them. Father, I thank you for that. Father, I pray for those that um, are considering to say yes to becoming an officer within this body. Father, it's not something man desires. It's something that man must be called by you. And I pray that it be a clear calling in these men's lives. I pray for those that are nominating that they would pray before they ask. Father, I thank you for officers. I thank you for the, for the deacons and their love to serve you and serve the body. I thank you for the session and what they um, strive to do and keep, keep the church in a spiritually uh, 
straight line with you. Father, and I pray for those that are going through illness. I pray for Janice Esposito. We rejoice that all has gone well. We continue to lift her and Tony up to you. We pray that your hand, even today, will be upon her, that you give her peace that only you can provide. Father, I pray for Mike White. I pray that you would just continue to, to guide him, that he would um, follow your leading, and I pray that we as a body would love upon him. And I do pray for, for Angela's grandmother, Peggy Thomas, and what she is going through, and I pray for Angela and her family. Father, I pray for others within our body that have unspoken requests. I pray that your hand of love and healing will be upon them. I pray that we as a body would understand our, one of the greatest challenges we have is to show love. And I pray that we have a heart of love. Father, I pray for our sister church. I pray for Christ's church. And I pray for their ministry there. I pray that you would bless that ministry. And Father, I pray for John and Becky Long and the struggles they are going through, particularly physically. I pray that they would feel your hand, your love, your presence upon them even this day. And Father, I pray for your world. I pray particularly today for France and Finland. I pray that um, your hand would clearly be upon that nation. And that, Father, that... Um, there would be a revival within that nation. I pray for those that are, that are ministering there that you would bless them. You would give them um, just a perseverance to drive on. Father, I think in closing, I think of the verse in, in James where it, it doesn't say that we may have trials. It doesn't say that we may have temptations. It says we all are. And Father, I pray that as we go through those trials and temptations, we will look at the end of that verse when it clearly tells us that it's for our benefit, it's to, it's to bring us more mature, it's to develop our character in Christ. I thank you for verses like that. Father, I pray that, that this will be a day pleasing unto you, that the words spoken, the words taught, the words that are sung, would be a sweet aroma to you, deserving that you are. Father, continue to watch over us this day, continue to guide us, continue to direct us, and Father, may we leave here desiring to please you, not just on Sunday, but on every day of the week. Father, I pray these things to, to you, a great God, knowing that you hear, knowing that you care, knowing that you love, and most of all, knowing that you hear and answer. Father, Father, I pray these things in your precious son's name and all of God's people said, amen. Philippians 2, 12 says, basically, as God works in you, you work out your salvation. When it comes to tithing, God has given you. He's giving you money. For you to continue that work by giving it. So let us now do, let us work out our salvation, what God is working in us by giving to the Lord.
As our worship offerings are brought forward, let me invite you to please stand and together we'll sing the doxology, giving praise to our God. present God, with this offering we present also ourselves, all that we have been, all that we are, all that we shall become, and our resolve to walk in your way. Accept us and our offering this morning, we pray, for Jesus' sake and in his name. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated, and our children ages four through first grade are dismissed for junior church. And Dan and Terry, if it's okay, I'm going to move this microphone out of the way. Well, once again, good morning. I want to give an explanation, but not an apology to anyone who might be visiting with us. Um, before we sing our hymn of preparation, just let me say, this may not be a sermon that you'd expect when you come to visit a church, but... It's our practice here to preach straight through books of the Bible, and that means two things. One, we can't skip the hard parts, and two, we might not always like what the scriptures say. So have that in mind as we stand and sing together verse 1 and 6 of How Firm a Foundation. Now that you're seated, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter, Peter and the second half of verse 10 of chapter 2, going through verse 16. And we're continuing in the letter that reminds us again, not all churches are safe, not all preachers are honest, not all sermons are true. To remind you again, it's the end of the Apostle Peter's life. And he is concerned for these groups of churches he's writing to that are struggling with false teachers within and persecution without. In chapter 1, he essentially urged the church the best thing they could do is grow in the true faith of Jesus Christ. But now in chapter 2, he's been focused on the danger of false teachers. And we can sort of summarize the chapter this way. Verses 1 through 3 taught us false teachers will always be a problem for the church. Verses 4 through the first half of verse 10 vividly showed us false teachers will certainly be judged and will not escape. And now this morning, verse 10b through 16 will give us, hopefully equip us, with ways to recognize false teachers, and to see 
that the condemnation that we read about last week is just and deserved. And then next time, the remainder of chapter 2 will really reveal to us the fruits and the futility of these false teachers' ministries. Now, I want to say, in light of all this, the Christian faith is based on truth. God's truth found in God's Word. And the church is described in 1 Timothy 3.15 as the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So here's what that means. There is a real danger then when false teachers and heresies seep or creep into a church. So how can we recognize them? What are they like? Now I would suggest we don't need to be continually fearful and suspicious, but we do need to be wise and we need to be discerning. So let's learn what we need to look for as we look together at 2 Peter 2, second half of verse 10 through verse 16. This is the word of the Lord. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. God's word. I'm always comforted knowing God could speak through a donkey every time I come up to the pulpit. And it also reminds me of our great need to pray as we study God's word. So will you pray with me? Oh Lord, open our eyes to your truth this morning. Give us faith to believe. And give us an appropriate trembling at the warnings of Scripture. And an appropriate wisdom and discernment to apply them. Help us to love the tr truth and contend for the truth, even with tears. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm going to break my pattern of the last two weeks, and I'm not going to share about a painting. But someone said to me, I think it was encouraging a week or two ago, that they like that when I preach, I try to address the elephants in the room. And 2 Peter 2 gives us a lot of elephants to deal with. And perhaps the biggest one, not only in the church, but in our culture as well, the one thing you cannot do today is call someone out as a false teacher. As soon as you do, immediately you are accused of being unchristian, unloving, and of course, violating Jesus' command in Matthew 7-1, the most misapplied verse in the Bible, judge not, lest you be judged. Now, in the common way this is used, we can only assume that the Apostle Peter must have fallen asleep during that part of of the Sermon on the Mount. Sort of like me in international economics my junior year of college, in the front row, right in front of the teacher. <clears throat> but maybe Peter wasn't asleep, because just a few verses later, Jesus instructs them how to judge with humility and how to discern 
And of course, a few paragraphs later, in the same sermon, in the same place, in the same chapter in Matthew, Jesus himself gave us warnings against false preachers, false prophets, and how to recognize them. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. So maybe Peter was awake after all, and he's remembering his Lord's words, and now he's elaborating on the characteristics and the fruits by which you can recognize false teachers. Now again, this is highly offensive in our age. It comes across as arrogant to the culture and even to a lot of the church. But nonetheless, the Bible teaches it. So we're going to follow it, and we'll look at how Peter describes the perpetual characteristics of false teachers. First, they are boldly blasphemous. There's an incredible arrogance to preachers who tamper with the Word of God, and it's not easily hidden. We're going to see that in two ways. First, they're continually denying legitimate authority. Remember I said earlier, We preach straight through, then we don't skip over the hard parts. This is the first hard part. As a preacher, I want to tell you I know exactly what every single verse in the Bible means. But I would be lying. This is the second half of verse 10 is probably the hardest verse to understand in this chapter in one way. And that is the question of who Peter's talking about. It's clear these false teachers are speaking boldly and speaking blasphemy, that is, evil against God, his perfections, and his truth. But the question of more specifically who they're blaspheming at the end of verse 10 is a great debate. Some say it refers to false teachers actually blaspheming angels in regard to how they execute God's judgment. And then verse 11 would give the contrast to say, even the angels leave that kind of judgment to God alone. Others say because the word that our scripture is translated glorious ones is actually literally just glories in the Greek, that maybe it means they're blaspheming Christ himself. But here's why we don't need to worry that much about it. The application is clear. What we can see, while the meaning of who they're blaspheming is not completely clear, their character is clear in their blasphemy. Now, you may not like that word, but if you notice, it appears three times. Once in verse 10, once in verse 11, once in verse 12, so it's kind of hard to skip over it. These false teachers are bold and willful and arrogant in teaching false things, in slandering God, speaking against his authority or the authority of his representatives. They're speaking against his truth and his gospel. Dick Lucas and Christopher Green, commentators, explain, although it is difficult to decide on these details, the basic weakness in the false teacher's position is clear. Peter is comparing their, I love this, brazen egoism with the respect for God's word that the angels demonstrate. Angels are obedient messengers who don't take it on themselves to alter the message they deliver. I wish all preachers could say that. This kind of arrogance, bold and willful, is exactly the opposite of what kind of character faith in Jesus Christ is supposed to produce in us, supposed to mark us. And Peter taught us that back in chapter 1, verse 5. Knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. And again, as Jesus said of the false teachers, you will recognize them by their fruit. Today, you can see this arrogance when you hear a teacher in essence say, everyone else has gotten this passage wrong. Listen to what I say it means. Or when they boldly explain how Christ, how Scripture does not say something that it clearly says, often because they don't like it or because they know their audience won't like it. See, edginess sells. 
Orthodoxy is boring. It's easy to discard inconvenient Christian doctrine and ethics in order to be more appealing and attractive to the world. PCA pastor David Strain adds, rejecting the ancient convictions received by God's people from the scriptures about who God is, about the tr authority and trustworthiness of the Bible, about who Jesus is and what he has done, about what it means to be male and female, made in the image of God, about the way of salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone, about what it means to walk in purity and piety before the Lord. People who reject these basic convictions received by God's people from the very beginning are seen today as free thinkers, independent minds. Strain finishes, and apparently there is nothing more admirable in our cultural moment than that. Scripture is always relevant, isn't it? We need to make sure the truth we've been given by Jesus through his word is deeply rooted in us. We hold up all the teaching and preaching we receive. I appreciate Steve's words, but even Brian and I, please don't take every word we say as God's own truth. Hold it up to God's word. We have to hold up God's word and compare it to the teaching and preaching we receive, the podcast we listen to, the books we read, and see, do they align with the clear teaching of God's word? We don't allow scriptural truths, especially the core ones, to be ignored, denied, redefined, or twisted. And that also means we need to be bold enough and loving enough to show the truth to those who may fall under the sway of false teaching. If someone's reading a book that you know is pure garbage, no offense, it's not loving when they tell you how great it is to say, oh, okay. You can say it nicely to them without being arrogant. Say, well, this conflicts with God's word here. Are you sure you understand what this teacher is saying? Those who do falsely teach against truth, Peter makes clear, are destined for destruction. He now compares these false teachers, and again, we're going to be politically incorrect, incorrect, to animals. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. He's saying false teachers behave like wild animals. How? They follow their natural fleshly appetites, their instincts, without regard for God's standards and ignoring his promised judgments. That's one way they're animals. They're animalistic in speaking ignorantly, without reason, and blasphemously instead of truthfully and thoughtfully. Again, that's one way they're animals, but here's another, again quoting Lucas and Green, like farm animals reared for slaughter, these teachers had a, ahead of them only judgment and condemnation. Again, we can always do the disclaimer, unless they repent, unless they turn from their sin and turn to God. But when Peter says they will also be destroyed in their destruction, when they will get the wages for what they have done, he means in light of the fact that their teaching is destructive. Their immoral lifestyle is destructive. And what it does to the church, then their condemnation is appropriate, it is just, and it is right. They will reap exactly what they have sown because God is just. The warning of the fate of the false teacher should give us some motivation, too, for self-examination. Are we living spirit-controlled lives that seek to conform to the Word of God, or do we let ourselves be driven by our appetites, our lusts, and our desires? And here's a good way to determine that. Ask yourself, 
How often do you tell yourself no? Do you ever deny yourself something specifically out of reverence for Christ, out of love for him and submission to him? Those of you in adult Sunday school, Don talked about submission in 1 Peter. Do we ever say no? Our culture says you can't say no to yourself and be authentic. And authentic is the highest value. And Scripture says you can't be authentic and holy. You can't be authentic and obedient. What God says is more important than what you feel. And in all of this, despite what the culture will tell us, when we say no to ourselves, when we don't do something out of reverence for Christ, we're not deprived. We're actually more fulfilled, knowing we're doing what pleases the one who loves us more than we can fathom and knows what's best for us, even when we don't. By contrast, the fuel for the ministry of these false heretical teachers is they are ultimately driven by corrupt desires, starting in the second half of verse 13. If the first part of our passage focused on their attitudes and their false teaching, their speech, the second part really focuses on their behavior and their motivations. First, we see Peter describing them as delighting in deception. Second half of verse 13 rattles off several more things about false teachers. They love carousing. Fill in the blanks for what that looks like. They love carousing and other depraved acts during the day, openly, meaning shamelessly. Calling them blots and blemishes, we probably don't have an idea of what that means, but that's a contrast to what Scripture talked about being genuine offerings and sacrifices in the Old Testament. They had to be without spot or blemish. Leviticus 1.3, among many places. But it also contrasts with how genuine believers are called to live before God. Peter's going to tell us in chapter 3, verse 18, to be found by him without spot or blemish. And we see their reveling again, delighting in deceiving believers. And it sounds like even during the Lord's Supper is a time when these false teachers will be living differently, pretending to be something they're not. One author puts it this way, on the one hand, they will seek out opportunity for sin. On the other, they are fully engaged, even leading apparent godly lives, taking part in the celebrations of the church. And they find satisfaction in this double life, even as it harms the body. And again, it's probably obvious But false teachers always pretend to be something they are not. I love the picture that our secretary Beth found this week to go with the announcement of this sermon. And for those of you who aren't on our Facebook page, it was very simple. It was a picture of a live sheep. But then the shadow of that sheep on the wall was the shadow of a wolf. What a biblical picture. Great job, Beth, wherever you are. Wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what false teachers are. And verse 14 shows they're hungry and hunting like a wolf. Cue the Duran Duran song here. They are insatiably lustful, greedy, and debasing. Did I just quote an 80s band? I'm sorry. Peter says that their eyes are looking for opportunity for sexual sin. In fact, their appetite for it cannot be sated. They use their influence, the people they are over as teachers, to corrupt and debase those in their flocks. Think of all the recent mega church leader scandals where it came out they had abused their influence and position to sexually prey on those under their care. Do a Google search. You'll find more incidents of it than you could possibly imagine. Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us there is nothing new under the sun. Satan's strategy remains the same. Man's nature remains the same. And sexual sin continues to corrupt and infest the churches, as does love of money. 
as Peter adds, they have hearts trained in greed. They've practiced greed so much that they are excellent in feeding and indulging it. In their unrestrained self-indulgence and spiritual foolishness, Peter says they are accursed children. They're under God's curse. They're destined for wrath. And again, since there's nothing new under the sun, Peter shows these pleasure-seeking, greedy, corrupt false teachers are following a well-worn path. Way, as it says in verse, six, verse 15, is often used in Scripture to describe a direction in life. The early Christians said they were followers of the way. And Peter says these men have left the right way, the way of following Christ. And as he's done earlier in the chapter, he again uses an Old Testament example featuring the poster child for profit and pleasure-driven false prophets. Ladies and gentlemen, Balaam, son of Beor, found in chapters 22 through 24 in the book of Numbers. And if you don't know that story, he was a pagan prophet hired to curse the people of Israel, and the Lord stopped him repeatedly, making him three times when he tried actually bless the people of God rather than curse them. After that failed, we find out in Numbers 31, 16, instead he was able to lead Israel into adultery instead through foreign women. But before he had his three times of trying to curse and blessing, God had to demonstrate the foolishness of his sin as he rode a donkey who then basically caused him to get hurt, and he starts beating the donkey, and God has the donkey rebuke him. Now, if a donkey has to tell you how beastly and foolish you are, it's a clear sign you may need a little help. It's a clear sign of your madness. But as I thought about this, I was reminded really all of our sin is ultimately madness. It's sinning against the one who is completely holy, sovereign, good, and loving. And sometimes we think he doesn't see. But it's even more maddening, more madness, when it's deliberate rebellion by those who claim to speak in his name. That's especially foolish. It invites the wrath and curse of God, and it needs to be strongly spoken against. Now, Maybe you're wondering, where is the grace? Where is the love of God in this passage, Dave? What kind of church is this? And I want you to say, first of all, do you realize it's God's grace and kindness and love to warn us like this? Ask people who've been involved in a cult or false teaching if they would have benefited from hearing and recognizing this before they got into it. Do you realize it's God's grace and love to warn you? Peter's tone may seem strident, even angry, but the nature of the threat requires it. How would you, parents, respond if you found someone was secretly putting slow-acting poison in your children's food? I don't want to judge. I don't want to be condemning. I'm supposed to be loving to these people, right? No. You would be rightfully angry and concerned. How should a loving pastor like Peter respond when he knows someone is deceiving the Lord's people with lies and deceptions that weaken faith, kill spiritual life and holiness, and may lead them to eternal condemnation. Is that overstating it? Because if the stakes are eternity and the souls of men and women are in the balance, I don't think so. There's also grace in being shown the ways and character and method of false teachers because the passage tells us they seek to entice us, to lure us. The Greek word is one that would be used of fishermen. That's for you boys in my family. 
fishing with bait, drawing people in, luring followers to compromise the truth and the holiness God desires. Remember Peter said, who, does he, who do they entice? Unsteady souls. So the best antidote against false teaching is continually growing in your understanding of the true gospel. As we were taught earlier in the first verse of this chapter, false teachers will always be a threat to the church in every age. Even if we don't have a false teacher problem in our church, I hope we don't. Where's Brian? Keep an eye on me. The internet, podcasts, blogs, and books are still subtle ways the enemy can now get false teaching even into Bible-believing churches. So people of God, we are called to be discerning. I found a warning by Miguel Nunez, a Reformed pastor, on this passage to be helpful and maybe a good way to close our time. He writes, Perhaps you believe this discussion about false teachers and their desires for money and immoral lifestyle has nothing to do with you because you're not a teacher of the word or a leader. But the stories gathered in the Bible were recorded for the instruction of us all. And all of us may experience the kind of attraction to money that these false teachers experience. And then he mentions several ways that greed can tempt all of us to sin. But then also, the immorality of the false teachers is a warning for us as well. Nunez asked this question, what pleasures are you seeking that call you away from the path of righteousness? You might not carouse in broad daylight, as the false teachers did in Peter's time, and yet perhaps you secretly indulge in pornography. Others are involved in adultery, but deny it again and again. For all of us, there will be some particular pleasure which tempts us away from what is right. God is always watching and calling us back to the right path, but it's up to us to heed his voice. He concludes, we must remember that pleasure is fleeting, temporary, and transient, but the consequences of sin are long-lasting. God cannot be mocked. End quote. Let me leave you with that. In love and mercy, God is always calling us to repentance. False teachers and everyday struggling sinners alike. He calls us to turn from our sin, to seek anew his mercy and forgiveness, and to turn back to him through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you heed his voice calling you back to him today? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, Lord, we know we are weak. We know we are vulnerable. We know we are easily tempted. And Lord, often we are ignorant of the dangers we face. So Lord, we ask, protect your bride. Protect your church from those who would entice her members to deadly error and entangling sin. Lord, may we also, in dependence upon your spirit, strive to be without spot or blemish, not by our strength, but by the power of your grace and mercy to us in Christ. Preserve and defend us, we pray, for our hope is only and always in you alone. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, after some dark reminders, let's sing of a great reminder that brings us through the dark. My hope is built on nothing less. Hymn number 521, please stand as Bob leads us.
hope to see many of you weather permitting tonight at 5 at Brookfield Park for our time of fellowship. But wherever you go from this place, go from this place with the benediction, the blessing of your God. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. And all God's people said, Amen.